Okay, we're reading Plato's Phaedrus in my Writing 303 Introduction to Rhetoric course. I want to use this video to talk about some general themes. What is the Phaedrus? What does it cover? What is its structure? Why do we read it? What is interesting in it? What can we reflect upon? So a very kind of zoomed out, broad, broad start to thinking about the Phaedrus. And in my course, I've also posted some notes by, by Robert Cavalier, or Cavalier, I don't know how he says it, from Carnegie Mellon University, a philosophy professor there, who has some nice has some nice notes on this and this is a piece that I, I came across many years ago and um, I read it in a, a graduate seminar on say I think it was um, phenomenology and the philosophy of technology but it it's, has stuck with me as, as being an important piece a lot of say rhetoricians read it because it is because it so closely looks at this relationship between philosophy and rhetoric, because it looks at the construction of speeches, and because it's a, I, I dare say, a fun, a fun thing to read in our, in our introduction to the piece, it commonly regarded as, as a literary masterpiece. I don't know if we, I don't know who says that, but we might call it a literary masterpiece. So what is it? It's a dialogue. It's a platonic dialogue. So written by Plato, Plato being a disciple of Socrates. Now Socrates himself never wrote anything that we know of, right? We, we have no extant fragments or surviving parchments or papyri from that period. We don't think that Socrates wrote anything down himself, but Plato did. Plato did write things down, and what he did often was put Socrates as a character into his dialogues, and through Socrates demonstrate some of his own positions. So one of the hallmarks of the Phaedrus is we'll see Plato's theory of the forms come out, and this is his metaphysical position that we often talk about in ancient Greek philosophy. And so this is to say that Somewhere beyond this physical reality that we see, this Im immediate material reality, there are perfect forms of all, of all we see floating out there. And maybe before, say, we were born or after we leave this world, we come back into touch with those forms. And when we know something about the world, we're actually remembering its perfect form. It's a different way of thinking about the world. It's, a, it's certainly a different way of thinking about the world than we have now today. The concept of soul in ancient Greece is much different than, say, the, the Judeo-Christian soul. Um, nonetheless, there's a proof within the Phaedrus that attempts to show how the soul is immortal. Um, now, whether you're, say, you, you're spiritual or religious or an atheist or agnostic, it's still interesting to think about the soul because it's been such a central concept to human thought for so long. So whether you, you say have a personal belief or you think it's hogwash that, that the human might have a soul, it's still interesting to think about how that informs thought and um, to, to try to analyze what they meant by soul and is there anything useful there that we can think about. And, and I think there are some interesting things we can think about in terms of, of what the soul is and how does that relate to how we say live in the world and account of the world. Okay. So so Plato did write dialogues and included Socrates in ma many of his dialogues as a character. Our second character here is Phaedrus, which is Socrates' friend and a, and a younger friend. And perhaps they have some kind of, um, we want to say, romantic connection, um, which is not uncommon, right, to have this a, a sort of um, elder male individual take on a sort of younger disciple in ancient Greece or a, a younger individual and say tutor them, instruct them in a kind of mentor relationship that also perhaps goes a little bit further than that. I, I don't study at great length these kind of interpersonal relationships in ancient Greece, but they're again different than, than what we have today of, of course. Um, 
So that's something to think about is like what's the in the exposition of this piece, how do they how do these characters say know each other? How do these people know each other, right? Um, now another thing to note is and I'll post a map of of ancient Athens in Canvas for you to look at if you're in my class or I'll post a link here in the YouTube video if you're not. Um, this is a very situated dialogue. It's a dialogue that is taking place somewhere and the place it's where it takes place actually kind of matters. You can almost read these dialogues like little plays, right? Like two character plays. And so you want to think about the setting. Where are they? Well, they're actually Phaedrus and Socrates in this dialogue, in the Phaedrus, are actually leaving the walls of, outside the walls of the city of Athens to go on a little walk. And you'll see this in the first, um, in the first few, few pages of it even. It's like they've, they have, the, it almost sounds very silly when we're reading this serious dialogue and they're talking about, oh, should we sit by the shady tree and listen to the cicadas and how, you know, isn't the river beautiful? And so they're actually, there's a very like place oriented. It's a very, um, it's a very situated dialogue. It has a place, it has a setting. And that setting matters for, for Socrates especially because he is a kind of urban knight. He doesn't often leave, he doesn't often leave the city. So that kind of urban and, and rural contrast is, is a, a theme to kind of think about right off the bat in the Phaedrus. Now, another top-level discussion is, another top-level thing here, just when you're reading a platonic dialogue, you'll notice there's some numbers in the margins, and they might look kind of unfamiliar to you. Now, in Phaedrus, we start um, 227B, 227B, C, D, then 228, 229. And these are our Stephanus numbers. So this goes back a few hundred, a few hundred years. Um, this was a kind of way, uh, so our, we have this a scholar from a few hundred years ago who took a lot of these, these fragments, these surviving fragments, and tried to find a way that we can refer to them universally across scholarship in a useful kind of way. Um, because page numbers aren't always going to line up depending on, say, how we, f what size font we're using and different printed editions. And so this is a way we can actually reference specific portions in the text using these margin numbers. Um, it's, a, it's a special sort of um, reference system that's been in use and been developed for for quite some time, and it's unique to it's unique to Plato. There's different. You'll see a different system of numbers in Aristotle. It's because we we're we're taking this. You know, we we sometimes don't think about this, but these are you know tattered pieces of papyrus and really ugly things. We had to kind of skim and scan and bring together to to put together these the, the surviving pieces of, of some of our ancient works, and then we have you know, the whole mess of translation through the epochs and ages. And so this is a way to kind of, um, say, formalize the way that we talk about a specific passage. So when you refer to a specific passage in the Phaedrus, you don't say on page, you know, 517, as I have it in the PDF, or page 4 of the PDF. You know, you refer to, say, 238b. So I'm looking at 238b. Ah, okay, this is the passage where so and so on. That way, across editions, across prints, um, across time, we can, we can identify specific portions of the text that we're talking about. So that's another useful thing to think about. But back to the dialogue itself. So we have Phaedrus and Socrates. They leave the city of Athens. They actually go outside the walls of the city of Athens and, you know, look at the beautiful river and the trees and the, the course of the cicadas and how wonderful. And then you see this kind of playful relationship. I mean, Socrates is actually teasing Phaedrus a little bit throughout this dialogue. And, and Socrates is goading him on at first. He's saying, okay, I know you've been with, with Lysias, this famous orator in the city. Why don't you see if you can repeat for me this speech that he gives on love? I know you've heard it many, many times. I know you, you, you love this speech about love. And so Socrates then you know, says, go on, go on, do it. And Phaedrus begins then at, in, 
and Stephanus number 231, 231a. Now you'll notice the a is not, the a is assumed. In the Stephanus numbers, we don't, we don't have the a there. You won't see an a always. It'll just say 231. The a is assumed. You'll see it goes 231, b, c, d. The a is assumed. So 231a is, is approximately where Phaedrus begins his, he's, what he's doing is, is say, um, mimicking or mirroring what he remembers of the speech of Lysias. It's not clear to me whether he's reading it, say, from a scroll or something, because Socrates gives him the, the prompt, read on. But earlier, they're talking about how um, Phaedrus is saying, how could you uh, expect me to remember the whole thing or something like that. So it's not clear to me whether he has a scroll or whether he's doing this from, from memory. Um, truly, that it, I mean, it's an interesting question. I mean, I don't want to say it doesn't matter, but so there's two hints there as to what goes on, and they conflict with one another. But then, so Phaedrus goes on 231a uh, through 230, let's say, um, 231a through 234c. This is the, a repetition of his memory of, of Lysias' speech on love, and it has to do with self-interest and so on and so on. Um, I better back up again. Now, here's something interesting. The Phaedrus, and I should have said this right at the start, the Phaedrus at first seems to be a dialogue about love, and that's a major theme. It's a major theme, but it's not really about love. It's not really about love. It's really about speech making and rhetoric and communication and the soul and truth. These are the real themes that are underlying. Um, the, the topic of love is just kind of a what do we want to say, um, a kind of decoration on the cake, so to speak, or the topic of love is just the, the way through which they're exploring these, these much more foundational and fundamental and serious topics. But not that love isn't serious in itself. I mean, um, and there are some interesting comment, or there are some interesting portions of the dialogue where, where we start talking about madness and uh, madness as a gift from from the gods and the relationship between madness and love and madness and creativity and those are re really interesting concepts but there, there, love is just kind of the over it's the color of the piece when they're really talking about speech making and oratory and rhetoric and truth it, it could be really any topic that they use to dive through it. But love in itself is a useful topic. I mean, it's a almost nearly human universal. Um, there are different types of love that we have between, say, you know, we have sexual love and, and familial love with family members and, say, love for community or, or say, um, solidarity, a kind of brotherly, sisterly love. Um, all different kinds of, of love, you know, love for a pet or a dog, and, and we all love in different ways, and love can be a very dangerous thing, too, in your practical life. You have to be very careful who you love, or you'll get your, get your heart broken, right, or, or get your bank account wiped out <laughs> pretty, pretty quickly. You have to be careful who you love, right? So it's a useful topic in itself. Love is a useful topic to consider in itself, but I just wanted to point out that it's not, it only is, say, superficially about love. Or on, at a surface level, the Phaedrus appears to be about love, but it's much more than that. It's much more than that. Okay, so then back, back to going through, say, what the structure of it. From 231a to 234c, Phaedrus is trying to remember the speech by Lysias. And then Socrates says, you know, a little bit of teasing, well, I don't really like this speech. Let me try one. Let me try a speech. So then Socrates does his first speech, and that's from 237b to 241d. And then Socrates says, well, you know, that isn't exactly true, though. My claim, the things I've said are not exactly true. So I want to do a real speech about love. I want to really, I want to get to the truth of the matter. So then this is the third speech in the dialogue, and Socrates' second speech, that goes from 244a to 257b. And this is where... Now, eros, eros is, is erotic love, right? You can eros, E-R-O-S, and, and say erotic love. You can see that etymological connection there. This is kind of sexual love. Um, 
and, and interestingly, that the the meaning of this has had changed at some point in ancient Greece. So in some of the pre-Homeric poetry, Hesiod, in his Theogony, Eros was uh, the son of chaos, which is say the the emptiness and negative force of the universe. Only later on is Eros the son of Aphrodite, sexual love, and so the, not that's not extremely Im important in this context, but but interesting here. Um, so we have in in Socrates' second speech, which is the third overall speech, uh, 244a to 257b, erotic love, Eros, is a, as a kind of madness or mania, and this is a really interesting theme here. And then we talk about the nature of the soul, or the psyche, from 245C to 246A. And then the movement of the soul, the mythos, 246A to 249D. And then kalos, love and the beautiful, the love and the beautiful, 249D to 257B. Interesting. Now then, then we go into some different places. This is kind of the first, say, part. This is part one of the dialogue, is the three speeches about love. The three speeches about love. Now, the second part of the dialogue, here we talk about the problem of written speeches, the relationship between speech, truth, and rhetoric. You have this interlude about the, the myth of the cicadas. That's this, um, you know, really quite interesting. The, the idea of where cicadas come from is, say, uh, um, these this group of people who danced and sang and danced and sang and um, the muses um, what enshrined them forever in the form of the cicadas so they could sing and sing and sing. It's quite interesting. It's an interesting little little tidbit there and you might make something of that too. It's like what is the relationship of music and culture in ancient Greece and how do, do they revere music certainly. Um, there are, um, and for the sake of um, the paper we're going to write in, in the 303 course, there's a lot of really interesting themes here. I mean, the theory of the forms, episteme, how do we know anything about the world? Madness, what is the relationship between creativity and madness? Madness and inspiration, madness and love. What is the, the relationship between madness and love? What is this thing about potions that keeps coming back throughout the dialogue, this idea of the pharmacon? There you can see the etymological origin of pharmaceuticals. It's like, what are the healing, what things in, are the healing, have healing properties? This keeps coming back right at the start even. It's a, Socrates starts talking about some, some kind of potion and making some comments about this. The relationship between truth and philosophy and rhetoric. And Socrates says, to be a good rhetorician, you must first be a good philosopher. You have to grasp the truth. You have to know what you don't know. You have to know how to come to truth. The metaphysical, the world beyond, the soul, the immortality of the soul. There's, there's tons to write about here. There's tons to break apart. Um, so in terms of thinking about a, a theme, if you want to write a scholarly um, say analysis of, of a theme or a section from the Phaedrus, there's a lot to dig into. There's, there's lots of really fun concepts to play with in here. So the love and the soul and writing and truth and philosophy and, you know, the chariots flying through the heavens. There's a lot to play with in here. But now, part two, the structure of part two is such that it goes like this. We have the problem of written speech, the, the kind of um, sidetrack myth of the cicadas, the relationship between speech, truth, and rhetoric, 259E to 262B. Dialectic, now we've talked about dialectic already. That's the kind of process by which two or more people are, are, are using language, say, in, in a way to get down to something, to get into truth by, by say, um, conversing. It's a kind of dialogue, right? So then we talk about speech in the soul, 269D to 274A then written and spoken speech, and then we actually have a little, um, we have a little bit of a, a summary and conclusion section there. So there, this is basically, um, this is it. It's, you can think of it in two parts. The Phaedrus is really two parts. So part one is the three speeches, um, Phaedrus repeating or his memory of Lysias' speech, and then Socrates' two speeches. And then the second part is about the nature of speech.
the nature of speech and truth and rhetoric and philosophy so i think that's enough for now this turned into a little longer video than i thought but these are the things to think about so again the feed us is a very situated dialogue it has a place it has a setting so try to picture it it's these you know socrates the old bearded philosopher taking his say younger um his younger friend Phaedrus out on a walk outside the city where they usually don't go they're being inspired say by the the song of the cicadas it's maybe a nice warm sunny muggy day and i've said this in other places too but ancient greek philosophy becomes so much more interesting when you realize these were these were just real people the way that we are you know they drank too much wine sometimes and um, sang songs and the, the, they played stringed instruments called the kithara, which is you know very similar to the guitar that we have today. Um, you can think about ancient Athens as like, you know, it had a population of maybe estimates vary, but maybe 120 to 160 thousand at its peak. Um, there was a marketplace, the agora. There were festivals. People wrote graffiti on the on the walls of, of public bathrooms. I mean. There's something there, you know, that's what I mean to say. Um, they had uh, theaters and, or say, you know, these um, putting on tragedies and comedies in, in public places and, and um, school rooms to practice gymnastics and a very similar classroom setup to what we have now, these kind of semicircular benches. It's like, it was it maybe 2,500 years ago, but it's, it's helpful to kind of envision what they were doing and, you know, they had minted um, circular currency, like <laughs> similar to what we have now, though I don't know that too many people use quarters on a daily basis, but that might be going the wayside, especially pennies. I mean, how often do you use a penny? But it's helpful to think about the, this, the situatedness of this dialogue, the real, the real action between Phaedrus and Socrates. They leave the city of Athens outside the wall. They go find a shady tree. And they're, they're giving speeches to one another, and they're, they're kind of having fun with it. They're actually, like, teasing each other and playing around a little bit. And, but then they get a little more serious, and they really start talking about love and the nature of love and, and what is love and um, what should it be and then what, are, you know, what is truth. And, and this is a key concept in rhetoric is, is you know, rhetoric is, is for Aristotle was morally neutral. But that means if you want to use it well, if you want to do good in the world, then it has to be, say, founded on something. And for, for Socrates, for what we say, Plato, Socrates, for Plato's writing of Socrates as a character in the dialogue, that means if you're going to do rhetoric, you should do philosophy too, to, to have something to base your speech and your ideas on. And that's philosophy, the kind of groundwork from which good speech comes from. Okay, so that's enough here. I'm gonna post a link to these these pretty nice notes by um, Robert Cavalier or Cavalier from Carnegie Mellon or Carnegie Mellon. My, I don't know, I never know anymore. And this is basically the Phaedrus. This is introduction to some major themes in the Phaedrus, how to read the Phaedrus, an outline of the Phaedrus, and, and this, is, this is just scratching the surface. There's so many interesting concepts in here, and it, it really is an artful dialogue. It's a nice dialogue to read, and it's, it's worth reading. It's sometimes paired with other, you could read it alongside the symposium, which is, you know, more speeches on love, and so that's an interesting thing to pair it with, to read alongside of it. Um, and then the Gorgias, which, you know, deals more with, with rhetoric. Um, but it can be read in itself, too, and that's what we're doing in, in my class. We're reading it in itself, um, and that's useful, absolutely useful, too. In fact, I, I don't know personally anyone who, who reads it side by side with anything else, but all right, that's enough for now. Have a good day, everybody.